Hello, my name is Nils Ibusna V R S E N, and uh, it seems to be addictive. This activity, this is uh, for video number five or something in my series about language learning. Uh, in the preceding one, I mentioned that translations can be useful in making uh, texts comprehensible, and I demonstrated some methods to make bilingual texts. Well, with so much many good things to say about translations, what why are some people uh, are so why are some people so vehemently against them? In fact, I can understand one reason why they should uh, be wary about translating. For a good reason. They, you could end up with people who never would say anything about uh, anything directly in the foreign language, but they would always think of something up in their own language, and then would they would translate, and if they also were perfectionists, then they would check up uh, the result against any a grammatical rule they could remember at that point of time. That would take a long time and they would never learn to speak fluently. The cure, in my opinion, is not to abolish uh, translations, it is to start thinking in the foreign language. Or speak out loud, is speak out loud if you prefer that, and you have the guts to do it. Start thinking the names of, uh, of things around you. Mm, this is a screen, this is me, this is a window, and um, postcards behind me, uh, then you add some adjectives, uh, a verb, I sit here, and uh, you end up being able to think in the foreign language, maybe with uh, stops here and there, with uh, errors, because you don't know some words, but uh, if you don't know a word, then think boop, beep, or imagine the word just go on like a bulldozer. The important thing is to keep the momentum. If your brain is full of uh, words in the foreign language, then uh, there's no chance that uh, your own language can disturb the process, and uh, that's what we want to achieve. If you can train this thinking skill, then uh, you are also on a good road to becoming fluent, because then you can just uh, start saying the things you have in your brain. As an afterthought, let me give a uh, little advice to people who cannot understand what they have learned to read. They can uh, read a text, they uh, know a lot of words, but uh, when it comes to understanding uh, something they hear in the television or on a in a film, uh, they don't get, get it. L if you try to understand what is said all the time, then you'll stumble over unknown words or expressions. That's a simple rule. That's a fact. Of course, you can get an idea about the content from a scattered couple of words here and there, or a couple of loan words maybe that you recognize, and then you can guess the general meaning, but you don't learn anything from that. You have to get down into the details. So the cure is just listen. You should try to pass the endless stream of babble into isolated words, phrases, sentences. Don't think about the meaning. If you actually know the meaning already of a word, then it will power up in your brain without any effort. And uh, when you know enough words, then the whole meaning will just come to you as a gift. I call this listening like a bloodhound follows a trail, because it means that you just follow the trail of words without uh, looking to right or to left, just going ahead. And in the long run, I think this will lead to a kind of understanding that is close to the one you have got in your native language, where you don't try to think about single words, you listen and uh, then the meaning is there, simply. It's much better than trying to frenetically guess the meaning on the basis of uh, a couple of words. People who, uh, as a part of their language learning, speak and listen all day, they would be better equipped than those who sit behind their screen uh, just reading a book or whatever they do, but in principle it is the same thing, uh, if you listen too hard for the meaning you lose it. So back to the translation. We all use translations to in the form of dictionaries. Some people advocate the use of monolingual dictionaries in order to add Avoid using uh, your native language all the time, I think it's stupid. If you need to look up words in a dictionary, then there's little reason that you can build understand the explanations in such a dictionary, in a monolingual dictionary, better than the text that they're just screaming 
long to get your uh, monolingual dictionary in the first place. Monolingual dictionaries can be useful, but for other reasons. For instance, to find examples, to find etymologies, and maybe also some uh, morphological indications, though even in a normal dictionary you should get those out. Normal by bilingual dictionary, I mean. If you are a native speaker who looks up a word in your own language in a dictionary in your own language, then you will probably not be satisfied with the kind of uh, empty babble that you will find in a monolingual dictionary. You'll want more information in where to get that, either in a lexicon or even better in some kind of a specialized uh, documentation. And for those of you who are language learners, the simplest and most effective information you can get is the one found in a good bilingual dictionary, which includes morphological information, as many translations as necessary to cover the uh, semantic area of the original word and some examples that illustrate how the word is used, including those cases where you cannot guess that the word would be used. It's not a secret that even words which denote, denote the same object in uh, the real world can have uh, different ways of, be of being used. That's why we say that languages are uh, idiomatic. And in the long run, we have to, be get, to get accustomed to the way uh, different language functions uh, by listening and reading a lot. And uh, there's no way around that. But in some cases, um, uh, an, an in some cases, an expression is idiomatic just because it's uh, used. Uh, you could have used another expression and it would have meant the same thing, but native speakers have just uh, made a choice. You have to learn which choice they have made. You have to make up uh, some table of uh, frequencies uh, in your head somewhere. In other cases, the, some expression has got a meaning you couldn't guess, maybe for because it had been used in a special situation, maybe because uh, you, don't, you know, don't know the background. In other cases, because uh, somebody got a good idea, and when you see it, it is clear why he got that idea, but you, don't, you cannot guess it before you have seen it. That's an ex a geometric expression. So, even if an idiomatic expression has a meaning that cannot be guessed from the components, you should always learn the meaning of the words that enter in that expression. An example, and I've taken it from a book, uh, The Big Red Books of Spanish Idioms. Oh, like that. Okay. Está más seco que una pasa. Un pasa. Is a raisin, and a raisin is a dry grape. So there's nothing unexpected in the meaning of the Spanish sentence in this case. Uh, to be more uh, dry than a dried grape. What makes it idiomatic is that you choose a grape, dried grape, to illustrate the concept, when you just as well could have used a freeze-dried piece of banana. Queda seco. Now we are getting further away from the obvious. A dead body can be stone dry as a mummy, but it normally doesn't happen overnight. And this unknown Spaniard who coined the expression must have been thinking about dried corpses as you find them in some uh, bone caves, in uh, capuchin caves, or maybe he has seen an Egyptian mummy, I don't know. But now the expression is there and you can use it even though, though you wouldn't have guessed that they and would use it in Spain. Dejar seco alguien, that means to kill somebody. Again, seco is appointed to the state of being dead in this, and there must be something in the mentality of the Spanish uh, thinking about de dead people as being dry. Mm, but uh, <laughs> in my mind, if, if somebody has been blown to pieces with a machine gun, I think of them as wet. But I'm not Spanish, it's not my me who decide. The Spanish have got seco. Dejar seco, we're getting to a point where I wouldn't have guessed the meaning of the expression even if I understand the individual words. But when I know both the single words and the whole expression, then I understand how the expression came into being and how it got its special meaning. And my chances of remembering the whole expression are much higher when I understand the thought behind it, which presupposes that I understand also the meaning of the individual words and just not uh, the meaning of the whole phrase. Those of you who, you who have seen my video about word list may remember the advice I gave for long words. If possible, split them up in their components. 
in the example in the Bahasa Malaysian you see here the word Mimiliki to own something becomes much easier to remember if you also learn the shorter words milik property. This is an example of exactly the same logic as I applied a moment ago on expressions consisting of several words, learn the components and the composite entity. Okay, welcome back. I know there are people who claim not to think through to think in words who say that they think in images or that they think in some way without babbling all the time. And I'm not speaking about uh, Indian gurus. When they want to say something, they say it, whoop, and uh, that's it. The thing, nevertheless, being able to think silently in your target language is a useful skill for language learners, as I have uh, said before, especially in case you are not the social type. Otherwise, you will never get uh, anything uh, said. But thinking in uh, your native language and translating uh, everything you say in your target language is uh, absolutely not a good idea. In fact, this syndrome is so bad that it may be the major reason that some people have uh, something a grudge against uh, translations in general as part of language learning. When you speak, uh, you simply haven't got time for that kind of activity. And even if you have got the time, you'll also have a negative effect on the, what you say. If you first have to formulate it in a different language, uh, you'll be bound by the idiomatics of that language. You'll, the word choice will be impaired, and um, what you say will simply not be uh, as authentic as it would be if you had formulated it in the target language from the start. It's much less of a problem doing it in the other direction. I'm sometimes traveling countries where I was still not quite ready to have full discussions in uh, the uh, local language. And then I've instead uh, translated what people said to me and what I said to them into the, that language. For instance, I visited Iceland last year and my Icelandic was not quite good enough, the f at least not for the first couple of days. So. I walk around uh, translating everything, but both uh, the things people said to me and uh, the things I said to them. Some kind of exercise, of course, uh, the important thing is that you get some training. And with those words, I'll say uh, good night.